lights and make me look more of a race. There's a light shining on the phone here, so I'm not touching it because it's bound to go off. There's a wee bit. Oh, no, oh, no. Is it true? Okay. Anyway, uh, you're very welcome again this morning. Welcome to those who are watching on Facebook and on YouTube. We hope that you enjoy our service this morning. It's so much better if you're actually here in person, but we know that Robin Smith and people like Adam Australia just can't make it every week. Uh, but we, we welcome them. Anyway. Who's that phone keeps going off? They're going to be stoned at the end of the service. Is it? <laughs> Start no more. He'll be stoning after the service. Anyway, a few people that we want to continue to pray for, uh, as we have been doing. Um, so, again, I've just been asking to remember Daisy, his sister. Daisy has cancer, and um, she's at a stage where she's just becoming very, very tired now. Um, but we just want to keep on praying. And you know, the Bible says, "Do not grow weary while doing good, for in due season you shall reap." If you, do, if you do not lose heart. So we don't want to tire uh, in, in praying for her and seeking God's face for her. Uh, also for the Martin family, um, Jim Martin's son Scott died um, during the week and we just want to be praying for them. I'm going to see them tomorrow uh, to make uh, preparation for the funeral. Uh, so please be remembering them in your prayer. And then a friend of mine, um, Dan McGill, his father, I have no updates, but his father was gravely ill the last I was talking to him, and uh, we just want to remember the family of prayer at this time. So let's just pray and commit this time unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you this morning for this opportunity to seek your face and to bring to you, Lord God, these petitions. Knowing, Lord God, that as we, as we pray for these people, Lord, we also know that you know the burdens that are on our hearts and the other people and the places and the things that maybe are making us anxious. Or fearful lord and we know that they're represented before you this morning and so we thank you lord that you're a god who cares and you tell us to cast all our cares upon you because you care for us but lord this morning we want to bring to you daisy and ask in jesus name for the outpouring of your holy spirit upon her that you lord god would be her strength and help as we sang earlier lord that we'll rise up on eagle's wings and lord we pray that that Daisy would find strength in you to rise up, O oh God, on the wings of an eagle. That she, Lord God, who waits upon you, will find her strength renewed in you. Lord, we pray for healing in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would rid her body of this cancer, please. Just commit her to you, Father, asking that you would draw near to her, that she would be very conscious and very aware of your presence with her, please, in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, for the Martin family at this time and the wider family circle and friends of Scott, Lord, who has, who has died. And we pray, Almighty God, that you would comfort them at this time in their loss, that you would be their strength and help. And in the midst, Lord God, of the, the trauma that, that grieving brings, Lord, we pray, please, that your peace that passes all understanding would touch the hearts and the minds of this family and that through, Lord God, this very very sad time they would be drawn to you lord god to know that there is hope in jesus a hope that surpasses death and may they take a hold of that hope please in the name of the lord i pray that all of the arrangements for the funeral would come together father and that in and through it you would be glorified and that we lord god would do a fitting tribute to scott and a, a tribute father that will bless his family and friends please we also ask you to remember the McGill family, Lord, up in Donegal, and we just pray for them. Uh, at this time, I have no update, Father, on the situation. The last I heard was uh, that Mr. McGill, Lord God, was very gravely ill. And I just pray, Father, please, that in the name of Jesus Christ, you would draw near to the family. If he is still alive, Lord God, we pray that you, Lord God, would have mercy upon him, and that he would again be very conscious of your presence around about him and that you would bless him and keep him in your love, that you would preserve him by your grace, and that through faith in Jesus, he too would take hold of the hope that surpasses death. Remember, Dan, Lord God, and the wider family, be their comfort, strength, and help at this time. Help them to keep looking to you, Lord God, please, for your intervention, not only in the life of, of Mr. McGill, Lord God, but also in the life of the wider family circle, please. And Lord, as we... Turn to your word to, to, to today, Lord God. We pray, please, that, that you would speak to us through it. We know, Lord God, we're dealing with a sensitive subject. 
a fearful subject. But nonetheless, Lord God, a subject that needs to be addressed. And we pray that you please would help us to hear what you're saying. So it's not just the people here in this hall, but the people who are watching it on Facebook and on YouTube. That Lord, your word would do its work. That it would speak into all of our lives. And that people, Lord God, would be saved by your grace through faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. God's word declares very clearly, if you read from Genesis right through to Revelation, God's word declares that God is a just God. That means that God cannot do anything wrong. And I know there are times when I've been to many, many homes where people have lost loved ones and they say, why, why did God take my money? Why did God take my dad? Why did God allow my son or my daughter to die? There's a lot of different questions that we have and a lot of different circumstances that affect us in life that can easily turn us against God because we begin to blame God. But God is always just. God cannot do anything wrong. He is perfectly just. He is a God who loves justice. Justice is about a person getting what they rightly deserve, but retributive or uh, retributive justice. I was joking about this on Wednesday night because some people say retributive, some people say retributive justice. It's a bit like tomato, tomato. I say whatever one comes easily out of my mouth at the time. But justice is about a person getting what they rightly deserve. But retributive justice is the principle that wrongdoers get what they deserve for their wrongdoing. Now it's really important that we grasp this because we're on this important subject. Wrongdoers get what they deserve for their wrongdoing. And because God is a God of justice, all wrongdoers. Now you've got to understand what's being said here. Because God is a God of justice, all wrongdoers who get what they deserve. Now the Bible says, for all have sinned. So that means we are all wrongdoers. And because God is a God of justice, all wrongdoers will get what they deserve. However, God graciously provided a means of appeasing his retributive justice by offering his sinless son Jesus to die instead of us or in the place of sinners. And thus Jesus bore the penalty for our wrongdoing. If you are a Christian this morning, if you are a born again Christian, as far as God Almighty is concerned, you are not guilty of anything. Because Jesus has borne the penalty for your wrongdoing. He has paid the price for all of your wrongdoing. And now the Bible says that those who confess their sin, that means agree with God that you are a sinner, who repent of their sin, turn away from it and leave it behind, and trust in Jesus, receive forgiveness for sins. And so if you're a born again Christian, that is what has happened. I hope that's what's happened as far as repentance is concerned. You have agreed with God that you are a sinner. You have turned away with the strength of God from the sin that you know that you were doing and were living in, and you have trusted in Jesus. Now it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're without sin. But the Bible has made provision for that. Because we live in sin-cursed bodies in a sin-cursed world, we as Christians need to continually come to God and say, look, I've let you down again. I've sinned again. Please forgive me. And his word tells us that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness whenever we come and confess it like that. Like that. And so our topic is the conscious punishment in hell of those who die Impenitent, impenitent. The conscious punishment in hell of those who die impenitent, or in other words, unrepentant. And obviously when you listen to it, please hear, in Shadow Christian Fellowship, and we will make this clear, and we will argue from Genesis through the Revelation why we believe what we believe. But in Shadow Christian Fellowship, we believe that no born again Christian will ever see hell. Understand, that is our understanding of the scriptures. You may disagree, we will argue with you from the Bible, but we don't get into argument for the sake of it. So the conscious punishment in hell of those who die impenitent, impenitent speaks 
of those who ultimately reject God's way of salvation, which is faith in Jesus, and therefore hell will be the glorification of God's retributive justice. Because those who find themselves there, those who find themselves in hell, are simply receiving what they rightly deserve. Remember, God is a God of justice, and all wrongdoers will get what they deserve. And hell will be the glorification of God's retributive, or retributive justice. For example, if there is no hell, there can be no justice. And if there is no justice, then there is no, no peace. And therefore, Christians do not have peace with God. And therefore, they are not saved, because what would it be that they are saved from if there is no hell? If there is no hell, then the death of Jesus on behalf of sinners is utterly meaningless. It doesn't make any sense that God should become a man, take upon himself the form of human man, go to the cross to die to pay the price for sin, if there is no consequence for sin. If there is no hell, the death of Jesus on behalf of sinners is meaningless. If there is no hell, those who die impenitent face no justice for their wrongdoings. Do you hear this? I'm, I'm, I'm driving this one from last week. If there is no hell, those who die impenitent face no justice for their wrongdoing. Unless, of course, they're going to imagine, as I was saying last week, some sort of spiritual Belfast Good Friday agreement. And so you've had all of these big waves coming from across America and everywhere else, Europe, to Belfast to celebrate 25 years of the Belfast Good Friday agreement, which was a complete and utter farce. Everybody who bought into it bought into a lie. Because the Bible teaches you cannot have peace without justice. And if there is no hell, then those who die impenitent face no justice for their wrongdoing. And what did the Belfast Agreement do for it to be able to work? It led out murderers, it led out people who committed the most heinous crimes that you could possibly imagine. It let them out with no justice. And what happened? The victims of those crimes have had no justice. The families of the victims have had no justice. If there is no hell, those who die in Canada face no justice for their wrongdoing, but according to the Bible, hell is real. And preachers need to warn of its reality. I don't know the last time that you were in a church that wasn't shallow, where you've ever heard preaching about hell, where you've ever heard people warn their congregation about the reality of hell. So I'm going to ask you a question here. This is just a question to the people in Shreve to see if you've actually ever listened to anything I tell you about. Can anybody tell me what my favourite film of all time is? Huh? Who said it? What did you say? Well, it was close, but it's not right. Fuck me! <laughs> Brokeback Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> like Debbie does Dallas. <laughs> My favourite, we've told you this hundreds of times. My favourite film of all time is A Christmas Carol. I absolutely love it. It is my favourite. I watch it about five or six times a year, not just at Christmas. And in, in Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge, a man after my own heart. He is a, he is a grumpy, selfish, miserly cheapskate. And he is visited by four ghosts. First, by his dead partner, Joseph Marley, and then the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And the interesting thing is, the visits of these ghosts help transform Scrooge uh, into this happy, selfless, generous, good-natured man. This is why I always say to people that if the three ghosts visited me, they'd flee in terror. <laughs> <laughs> but these ghosts and their visits, they, they, they turn Scrooge into this happy, selfless, generous, good-natured man who considered the needs of others and does them what he could do 
to help them. And some commentators suggest that the moral behind the Christmas carol is that in a socially divided world, where there are rich people and there are poor, we should always seek to treat everyone fairly, or as Jesus put it, love your neighbour as yourself. But about, among many other values that we can learn from Dickens' novel, there are these. Learning begins with listening. Learning begins with listening. And the second, only in death is it too late to change. So listen to the student again. Learning begins with listening and only in death is it too late to change. Turn please to Luke's Gospel if you've got a Bible with you and we're reading from chapter 16. Luke's Gospel chapter 16 and we're reading from verse 19. Again, I say this all the time, a very famous passage, but they're all famous passages to me because I'm constantly reading them. Uh, from verse 19, Jesus is speaking and he says this. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one return or rise from the dead. I sent a number of people out during the week, a wee video called 23 Minutes in Hell. And I sent it out for you to have a look at, not to say in any way, this is biblical. Not to say in any way that this is scriptural or that it's endorsed by Shelley Christian Fellowship. It was to give people an idea of what someone saw in a dream. So it was a dream. So all the time within dreams there could be mixtures of the flesh. There could be just mixtures of the activities of the day. You know, it's always a mishmash of stuff. But in this 23 minutes in hell, this guy spoke about, he went into it. First of all, he said it wasn't hell. He said it was Hades. But he went into this place and, uh, and he says that demons were torturing him and he could see into a fire uh, and, and, and millions of people in the fire. You couldn't see any faces, but you could hear them screaming in, in torment. Uh, and then he says, and even though there was a fire, he said the darkness of the place was so thick that you could feel the darkness, even though there was this, this fire. And the whole idea was to get people to see that there are different views of hell that people have. In fact, I remember some years ago, I don't know if anybody else uh, watched it, whether it was on YouTube or whatever it was, but there was some guy, he was a surfer, and he was stung by a man of war jellyfish or something like that, I think he can kill you. Uh, and so he basically uh, died, and his uh, story is how he went to hell. And in his story, it was complete and utter darkness. It was this thick, thick darkness that you could feel the weight of the darkness, and he was questioning, why am I here, why am I here? And voices, venomous voices were screaming at him, you deserve to be here, you deserve to be here. Uh, and the story was on anyway that this guy had 
being a Christian, and so he cried out to Jesus in this darkness and said, Why? I, I give my life to you. And the next thing, a light came and he shot up into heaven or whatever else. Again, it was a dream, it was a vision. But it's another idea of people's views of hell and what happens after death. And so this week, I have hoped to focus on what is hell. I was saying last week, I'm going to talk about what is hell. But I have been led this week in a different direction. We will get there eventually. But before I get into this today, I need to stress without any doubt, I do not believe that the parable that we have just read is in any way a glimpse into hell. But if it is, there's no doubt that those who end up there will be very, very conscious of where they are. It's the King James Version uh, that causes the confusion here. The King James Version uses the word hell in verse 23 when it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. But the actual word that's being used is Hades. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. Now, Colin was saying on Wednesday night at the Bible study, and it's right, that when Jesus is speaking here, the people that he's speaking to, first and foremost, are to the Jews. And they will understand this parable, because they believe in a place called Sheol. I'll look at it briefly, God willing, next week. But they believe in this place called Sheol, just a place where all of the dead go to wait for the day of judgment. And so the Jews would understand what Jesus is saying. But Hades is considered to be the dwelling place of all departed spirits. It is the unseen never world, as it's called. And it's been referred to, uh, Hades is also called Pluto. It's also called Orcus of the nether world. Now when you hear those two names, you immediately think, what? Pluto and Orcus? Pluto and Orcus are planets, well. Uh, Orcus is, is, is a dwarf planet. But you automatically think, then maybe that guy last week that I spoke about, Alice Huxley, who said, what if Earth is another planet's hell? What if Earth is another planet's hell? Now, just because they're called Pluto or Orcus doesn't mean that's, uh, that's where hell is on another planet. Hades is reputed to be the realm of the dead. It is the infernal regions. It is a dark, dismal place in the very depths of the earth where disembodied, wicked spirits reside. There was a video that came out some time ago as well, where they supposedly, I don't know, but you buy in the internet, I think. They drilled this far down into the earth and they put a microphone down and people said they could hear people in torment screaming. And I, I, don't, I don't buy into that. Um, but you know, people are saying anything to get you to believe and they think we don't we're not here to convince you about hell. The Bible is here to convince you about hell. So it's a book of, it's reputed to be the realm of the dead where all of the disembodied wicked spirits reside. But later Hades became more commonly used by the Jews and by others to refer to just the grave or of death and of hell. But, and I'm putting this on the record this morning clearly, Hades is not hell. Okay? Hades is not hell. And neither is purgatory. In fact, I would go further to say there is no such place as purgatory. It doesn't exist. I know the Catholic Church can't make up their mind about it. It was there for a while and people were buying their mass cards and praying for their loved ones to get out of it as soon as possible. And then when the Pope said there is no hell and the money went down, they came back and said it is there. Because the, the money will go back up again. But now I'm not one of other people's faith story. What I'm saying to you is, read your Bible carefully. Don't look to the priest or the tally board to tell you what it says. Read it yourself. You will not find purgatory in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Now some scholars suggest that Hades is the temporary dwelling place for those who die without Jesus. While others believe, as the parable suggests, that Hades is actually divided into two parts. So there is the first part, which is called Abraham's bosom, and that's supposed to be an area where the dead in Christ remain. 
until the day of their physical resurrection. And the second area is where the unbeliever suffers great anguish, torments, as they await the final judgment. Well, I don't believe for a minute that this is what Jesus is presenting. But rather, like many of his his parables, Jesus used this particular parable to teach important truths that we all need to learn to listen or listen to learn because Jesus is telling us vital, (coughs) vital information about a world to come. We need to understand that what he is trying to tell us is we need to learn to listen because learning begins with listening. So for example, we'll take the parable that Jesus used. For example, did the birth of Lazarus speak to the rich man who perhaps wondered why he wasn't begging of his gift anymore? If you read the parable, you'll find that this man Lazarus was brought to the rich man's gate every day and he was left there. Suddenly he's not there anymore. Suddenly there was no more dog crap to have to be cleaned up. Because we know that the dogs in the streets came and licked the man's wounds. So these are your similar stray dogs. Someone was going to have to clean up after them. So did the rich man suddenly realise, where's Lazarus? Why is he not here? anymore? Why am I not having to walk out with the poop strip anymore to clean up? Did, did Lazarus' death speak to the rich man? And if he heard that Lazarus was dead, did it speak to him of his own eventual death? And did he listen to learn? Well, we've all known, because I've even mentioned this morning, the death of Scott Martin, a very sad situation for that family at this time. We've all known people who've died. But did we listen to learn from their death? That one day too, we are going to die. And we have to be prepared for it. That is the lesson. The way you attend every funeral, you can listen to the minister preaching. He might give you a brilliant message, he might not. But the fundamental message that we all need to learn to listen to is one day our time is coming. We too shall die and we have to be prepared for it. Tomorrow is promised to no one. Death creates a level playing field. Both the rich and the poor die alike. But death is definitely not the end. And Jesus' parable demonstrates this. Death is only a door into a new world that we all must prepare for. Why? Because only in death is it too late to change. There is no opportunity to repent. There is no opportunity for anyone to turn away from their sins and to go looking to God for forgiveness if you have died. There is no chance that the Virgin Mary is coming down in the purgatory or anywhere else to bring you out of there if you were a a scapular warring person. There is no chance of salvation after death. Only in death is it too late to change. No opportunity for repentance. Maybe this morning you're here and you're a non-believer or watching in this morning on Facebook or on YouTube. In fact, we'll not call you a non-believer, we'll call you the unprepared. Maybe you're still in a state of unpreparedness for death. If you die, if you die, it's going to come at some point. And Hades is the temporary place of those who die without Jesus. I can tell you, you will be in torment, in great anguish, because you will know that your final judgment is coming, and you have no opportunity to repent. In Jesus' parable, the rich man, he wanted Lazarus, seeing him in, in Abraham's bosom, if you believe in this other part of of he seeing him in Abraham's bosom. He wanted Lazarus to be permitted to go to him to dip his finger in water and touch his tongue because he says, I am tormented in this flame. But 
But Abraham said it wasn't possible. A great chasm, a great gulf was between the two places that one couldn't go to the other and vice versa. And then the rich man asked that Lazarus be sent from Abraham's bosom to warn his brothers of the horror that awaits those who die in penitence or unrepentant. It was the guy who founded the Salvation Army, William Booth, I think his name was, who said, would to God, would to God that every Christian spent five minutes in hell. Because then they would go and tell their loved ones and tell everyone around them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rich man asked Lazarus, asked that Lazarus be sent from Abraham's bosom. Listen to me, tell you, see how better I die? None of you is better praying and say, Lord, send Tally back. No. I'm happy. Do not resuscitate. I might even get that on my gravestone. Do not resuscitate. Under any circumstance, anybody prays the Lord send Tommy back to war. I'm just going to, I'm going to haunt you. <laughs> so this rich man, he asked, he asked that Lazarus be sent back from Abraham to Jerusalem to warn his brothers of the horror that awaits those who die in penitent or unrepentant. And Abraham told him this that his brothers wouldn't believe. I know loads of people being over the years going around the doors and doing evangelism. Loads of people who say, see if God would just do this. See if God would just let me speak to my lover. And then you get all these other loopers who run off to fortune tellers and seances and all of these things which are completely demonic and contrary to God. Looking to hear from dead loved ones because they're grasping at straws. They want to know that everything's okay in the world to come. And of course the familiar lying spirits will fill their head full of whatever nonsense it is that they want to hear. Abraham told this man Lazarus, told him that his brothers would not believe even if Lazarus went back to them. In fact, when Jesus raised the other Lazarus from the dead, do you remember that Jesus is friend Lazarus? And, and Jesus raised him from the dead. And what did the religious leaders do? They plotted to kill him. They plotted to kill Lazarus because Jesus had raised him from the dead. And so Abraham tells uh, this rich man, look, your brothers are not going to believe me even if Lazarus went back. Sending a ghost may have worked for Ebenezer Scrooge, but in reality, ghosts can't save sinners. Only Jesus can. Abraham told the rich man his brothers had Moses and the prophets. In other words, he's saying they have the word of God and they should listen to learn from it because only in death is it too late to change. Hades is not what we at Shadow Christian Fellowship believe in uh, when we say in our statement of faith that we believe in the conscious punishment and hell of those who die in penitent. If Hades exists as a temporary dwelling place for those who die without Jesus, or in fact, if it is a temporary abode of all of the dead, split into two parts, Abraham's bosom for the believers, and a place of great anguish for the unbeliever as they await their final judgment. Let me be clear, it is still not hell. It is still not hell. Christian, I believe the Bible teaches, and I'm saying this and go search the scriptures yourself and see, I believe the Bible teaches that when a born-again Christian dies, we are instantaneously in the spirit. We are absent from the body and we are present with the Lord. And we are immediately with the Lord in paradise where we shall remain until the day of resurrection and we receive our glorious new bodies. That is what I believe the Bible teaches for the born again Christian. I don't believe that the Bible teaches born again Christians go to Hades or that when we are in paradise or in heaven that we can look into hell and see other people suffering in torment. I don't believe that. I believe this is what is called eisegesis. Eisegesis. It's a flashy word when a reader imposes their interpretation on a text or in other words when you read into something Jesus never intended the parable to say. When you read into it, something Jesus never intended his parable to say. His parable is just that. 
It is a parable. He is not letting us see into hell. He is telling us a very, very important truth. He's telling us that we need to learn to listen. We need to learn to listen and listen to learn. Listening to God's word and doing it. Because only in death is it too late for change. The point of Jesus' parable is death is not the end. But the beginning of a whole new world. Which all of us must prepare for now. And let me ask you this morning. And I'm speaking first to those who profess to be Christians. Are you prepared for the new world to come? Are you prepared when death comes? Now you know where you are going. Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared. We've got to learn to listen and listen to learn. Because only in death is it too late to change. There is no opportunity. And I know there are teachings within certain churches that say there's still another opportunity after death. There is not. There is no opportunity after death for repentance. And so this morning, speaking to the unbeliever or to the unprepared, if you're not yet a born-again Christian, then simply you haven't yet listened to learn. You haven't unstopped your ears. You're running like this towards hell with your fingers in your ears. You do not want to hear the truth. In fact, Paul the Apostle says that you have exchanged the truth about God to believe your own lies and you're heading to destruction with your fingers in your ears. And it is time this morning to take your fingers out of your ears and listen to learn. Death is coming for you and it is coming sooner than you think. And you need to prepare for where you're going to spend eternity. If Hades is a temporary place, for those who die without Jesus, the unprepared for unprepared for eternity. And if it is a place of great anguish, how much more terrifying is the prospect of hell? Hell is real. Hell is real. Please, I urge you this morning, listen to learn and act now. Before it's too late. Because only in death. Is it too late to change. Jesus who loves you. Came into this world. To die in your place. Jesus has paid the price. For all of your sin. He has paid your debt. In full. If you will do what God's word says. If you will confess your sin. Agree with God. That you are a sinner. And with his help, if you will repent, turn around and turn away from that life. And put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ now. You shall be saved. And as I said last week, there is no condemnation. There is no hell for me. This is to every born again Christian. Listen, every born again Christian. There is no condemnation. There is no hell for me. The torment and the fire. My eyes shall never see. Why? Because Jesus has paid our debts. And so put your trust in Jesus today and make sure you're prepared when death comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you this morning that as we are on the peripheries of this deep subject that is hell, we thank you that we can look into this unafraid. Because Jesus has paid our debt in full. Father, we ask this morning, please, that you would help us to recognize that the good news that we bear, that born-again Christians have, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be told everywhere to everyone so that they too, Lord God, could listen and learn, so that they too would be prepared for death when it comes. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the full and wonderful salvation that we have in your beloved Son. 
Thank you that there will be no sin charged against those who hide themselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. But hell is still a reality. And we ask, Lord, that you would lead us to people and in love speak to them of this reality. That they would repent of their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and find everlasting life in his name. Almighty God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he went through hell for us so that we wouldn't have to. Lord, may we live our lives believing your word, making ourselves always ready in a state of preparedness to meet with you, the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.